let's look biblically and experience this for ourselves. So you're in the back of the crowd. The crowd is gathered here early in the morning. And now we're going to witness what took place here. I'm just going to read this to you and do a little explanation. So we're going to be looking mainly at John's account of this, the Gospel of John. It says in John 18, 28, Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas into the Praetorium, the governor's headquarters, the palace of the Roman governor. And it was early, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium, so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate came out to them and said, What accusation are you bringing against this man? should also mention that there are eyewitness accounts and writings, Josephus and others, that this was Pilate's palace. Okay, so there's a connection with eyewitness accounts as well. So they bring Jesus here, Pilate comes out, what accusation do you have against him? Now the Jews are going to seek the death penalty for Jesus, but not just any kind of death penalty. They're not going to stone him, and that's really what they should have done because according to them, he was being a man making himself out to be as God. That was what they had a problem with, all right? And so according to the Jews, they should have stoned him. That would have been the right way, but they wanted something far more harsh because stoning was pretty quick. Crucifixion was long and painful. The criminals would hang on the cross, they would pound the stakes in their arms and in their ankles. And in order to breathe, they had to push up and then come down. It would just tear their upper body and it was just a battle. And some of these people that were crucified would stay on the cross for days. The first thing that would happen is the crows, the ravens would be in the trees and they would see a person defenseless, right down, pluck out their eyes, eat their eyes. And so it was just, it was painful. And of course, we know that our Lord Jesus had been flogged, had been beaten. He was just a bloody mess, okay? But anyway, the Jews wanted the harshest form of death and pain possible. They wanted a slow, painful death. But obviously, God in His sovereignty was using the wickedness of mankind. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God is going to use this wicked act because Jesus wants to display His love for us. He wants to display and show us His great love. So they answered and said to Him, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. You guys can handle this. I don't need to deal with this. The Jews said to Him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This happened so that the word which Jesus had said, indicating what kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. Prophecy said how Jesus was going to die. They would pierce him. They would pierce his side. Not a bone of his body would be broken. This happened so that the words Jesus had said would come to pass, and also Old Testament prophecies. So now Pilate is going to talk with Jesus inside his palace. So what we've happened so far is just outside. What accusation? This man weren't a criminal. We wouldn't bring him to you. And they want the death penalty by crucifixion. So now Pilate is going to bring Jesus inside. It says in John 18, 33, Therefore Pilate entered the praetorium again and summoned Jesus and said to him, You are the king of the Jews? Asking a question, Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? So they have a discussion, and then Pilate comes outside the palace and speaks again to the Jewish leaders. He says, And after saying this, he came out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no grounds at all for charges in this case. So Pilate examines him, comes out and says, I find nothing. I find no reason for why you are seeking the death penalty for Jesus. But to appease the Jews, then Pilate is going to have Jesus flogged. You know what flogging is? Okay, flogging is a, you have a stick, and off the stick is leather. And on the leather are glass beads, stone beads, small nails, sharp objects. And you take that and you go down the person's back. 
and so it just rips their flesh. Just rips it open. So it says in John 19, So Pilate then took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and put a purple cloak on him. And they repeatedly came up to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and slapped him in the face again and again. So now Jesus is going to go inside. Pilate's doing all he can to appease the Jews, has Jesus flogged. And then the soldiers mock him, make a crown of thorns for him. So then this happens. Pilate's hoping that now the Jews are going to be happy. And then in John 19:4 it says, And then Pilate came out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you will know that I find no grounds at all for charges in his case. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priest and officers saw him, they shouted saying, so the priest and the chief officers are down here, Pilate's on the lower platform probably, and Jesus is there, and the people down here, just, just think about this, you're watching this, you're experiencing this, they cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Not we can stone him, but crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no grounds for charges in his case. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die. Why? What's the accusation? Because he made himself out to be the Son of God, and then other passages making himself equal with God. Now we know that the Jews knew who Jesus was, there were so many signs, and of course then they would know that Jesus rose from the dead. They would pay the, the money to the soldiers to hide the truth. The curtain of the temple would be torn in two. Lazarus is raised from the dead. They know who Jesus is, and it says for envy, Pilate knew that for envy that they had handed him over. But the accusation that they had was at Pilate's house, the high priest says, tell us, we adjure you by the living God, are you the son of God? And Jesus said, yes, and you will see me coming back in power and great glory, riding on the clouds. So that was the accusation that they had. So once again, you have three options with Jesus. He was a liar, he was a lunatic, absolutely crazy, or he was who he said he was. He claimed to be God in the flesh. So then Pilate's going to go back inside with Jesus. Now at this point, he's been flogged. They've said, crucify him, so they go back in. And it says in John 19, 8, Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Because now Pilate knows that Jesus is claiming to be the Son of God. That's the accusation. And Pilate knows about Jesus as well. And he's also been warned in a dream by his wife. So Pilate's getting really nervous. And he entered the praetorium again right here and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Who would that be? Judas. Judas is the one who handed him over, but also these religious leaders. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews shouted, saying, If you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. And that's what Jesus was doing, making himself out to be a king. So then Pilate, he has this conversation with Jesus. Now he's going to come back out. So you see this? In and out, in and out. And it says in John 19, 13, Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. So... 
He went up to the upper stone pavement. We have the lower stone pavement. He went up to the upper stone pavement, sat on his judgment seat, the Bema seat, at the place called Gabbatha, and we can still see remains of that pavement up there. So, as I mentioned then, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. So then Pilate is going to concede. He's going to release then Jesus into the hands of the Roman soldiers. And then there will be a crowd that will follow Jesus. We know that Mary, Martha were at this event at the cross. So then after Jesus is released to the Romans and these officials, the high priest and the religious leaders, then he's gonna now go to Golgotha. He's going to carry his cross to Golgotha from here. Right through here. Right here. He's going to come out and go down. So right here where I'm standing, where you've walked, this would be where Jesus will carry his cross. However, he doesn't get far. It says, and when they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, as he was coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. Now these words, as he was coming in from the country, provide another strong proof that Pilate's palace or praetorium was here and not at the Antonia Fortress. The Antonia Fortress was surrounded mostly by walls and protected. This place fits perfectly in that it faced the open country, and this is exactly where Simon of Cyrene was coming from. So Jesus has spent the night at the house of Caiaphas. He's been beaten. He's been tortured there. So this is the area behind the glass where it's believed that Jesus was flogged, beaten. We have uh, hooks on the walls right here where they would put the people's hands through their wrist. He spends the night most likely in this uh, cold dungeon. I am reckoned with those who go down to the pit. I am like a warrior without strength. My couch is among the dead or my bed is among the dead. Like the slain who lie in the grave, you remember them no more. They are cut off from your influence. You plunge me into the bottom of the pit, into the darkness of the abyss. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. And then he's going to go to spend the night there. Then he's going to come here. He's going to be flogged and beaten here. But he's also, I didn't read you the account, but he's also going to go to Herod. He's going to go before Herod. Herod's going to have him beaten. Then he's going to come back here and get beaten. So he's just one bloody mess, our Lord Jesus. In Isaiah 53, beaten upon recognition. Can't even recognize who it was. So then Simon of Cyrene then is going to go behind Jesus. Jesus doesn't make it far and he collapses. He's lost a ton of blood. He's dehydrated and he just physically is spent. He is physically spent. And then he will, the strength that he has, will walk to Golgotha where then they will nail him to the cross. It will be nine o'clock when they nail him to the cross. Right now it is 927. We got here about an hour ago. So it probably took, I would say, maybe a half hour, maybe even an hour to get to the cross from here because it was a slow procession because he could barely walk along. And also the Romans crucified people in the most public places, okay, because they wanted to put the criminals on display. And so it would be a procession and everyone who saw it, they would get blood chills up and down their spine because they knew that if I step out of line, I have problems with the Roman government, this might happen. So it was a form of intimidation, extreme intimidation. And it would keep the people in check, so to speak. So they wanted to make this as public as possible so then they would go from here to Golgotha. 
And so we're going to be walking that path in a moment. We're going to walk it. Now let's briefly look at where the most likely route Jesus took from Pilate's palace or praetorium to Golgotha, which would be the location of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher today and was outside the city walls of Jerusalem during the time of Christ. The Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which means Holy Tomb, has over 2,000 years of evidence supporting it as the true authentic site. So from the judgment place of Christ at Pilate's palace, Christ's path would have gone along the outside of Pilate's palace toward the Jaffa Gate. There is no other option for this part of the procession. From the Jaffa Gate, there are two options to arrive at Golgotha. The first would have stayed outside the city walls and arrived at Golgotha. The second would have gone inside the city walls at the Jaffa Gate and then exited through the Geneth Gate, which means Garden Gate, and arrived at Golgotha. Taking into account that the Romans sought maximum humiliation for criminals and a chilling warning for others, I believe the best option is that the Via Dolorosa, which means painful path, went inside the city for a bit, then exited through the Garden Gate and then arrived at Golgotha, which today is the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. This, this is amazing. So, so this would be the this is the, would be the Garden Gate, the Ginneth Gate. So now we're going to be outside the city walls. This is outside now. So what are some faith lessons that we can learn from this? The Jewish leaders were responsible for the crucifixion. The Romans chipped in as well. But in reality, this was part of God's sovereign plan. They meant it for evil. God meant it for good. They will be held accountable. But in essence, it wasn't just the Romans or the Jews that crucified Jesus. Who was it? Your humble servant did it too. All of us were responsible for pounding a nail in that cross. And he died for our sins. So we all, in essence, put him on the cross. Now, Pilate had supernatural warnings from God. He, once again, was a self-preserving governor. He cared more about his own kingdom than about God's kingdom. So once again, we see the same principle, and you see it. He was gaining the world, and at the same time, losing his soul. Losing his soul. So what about us? Are we building our own kingdoms again, or are we building Christ's kingdom? Christ's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. Our kingdom is temporal, and we've seen that everywhere. What do we see of Pilate today? We saw a stone down at Caesarea. We know that he was here. We have writings about him, but where's Pilate today? Where are the people that yelled out, crucify him? The high priest who is maximum spiritual authority, where's he at today? Well, his tomb is down in the Hinnom Valley and it's used for a sheep and goat corral. The only wise thing for us to do is to build God's kingdom because our kingdoms don't last and we will be rewarded for building Christ's kingdom. Rewards await us. Scripture talks a lot about rewards. We will be rewarded. We see 1 Corinthians 3, many places. God's going to reward us. So we want to be building His kingdom. So here we are at this very, very special place, seeing all of the evidence right here before us. So once again, this just fits like no other place, all of the evidence and it was buried for many, many years. Had it been exposed, I'm certain the Via Dolorosa would be in a different place than it is today. 
Well, thank you for watching, and may God richly bless you.